my spooky friends. This is John, your host for Dairyland Frights. And I just wanted to ask you uh, if you could please help support my podcast here. I am now on Patreon. And if you could give a dollar, three dollars, everything helps so I can buy better equipment, uh, be able to afford, you know, maybe some studio time or, or get some additional people to help out with research. And I know you really don't have to do anything, but I, I truly appreciate it, especially, uh, you know, running this podcast all by myself can be a challenge them days, but I do love it. And I do appreciate all your support. And again, I say thank you, my spooky friends. I truly appreciate it. Hello, my spooky friends. I'm John, your host, and welcome to another episode of Dairyland Frights, the paranormal podcast that covers everything spooky creepy and mysterious in the midwest and again i I can't believe this the great guests continue on the podcast today i have author mark leslie welcome mark hey john it's great to be here thanks for having me oh uh again thank you so much for being on the show so let's do a little bit about mark shall we delve into mark's dark past (laughs) so first thing fun fact mark leslie is a canadian which there's nothing wrong with canadians that's fine you're you're okay (laughs) a uh anyway whose full name is mark leslie help me with this lebra (laughs) and that's why we don't use that name when we write (laughs) who and this is correct, correct me if I'm wrong, who jokes from my research that he decided to write under the name Mark Leslie because it would just be easier for people to spell and pronounce. Am I right on that? Yeah, and, and, and also with the last name being L, it'd be close to King when the books were on the shelves, you know, in the store. Oh. You know, a little uh, strategy there. Smart. Look at him. Mark <laughs> is a smart guy. I knew that all along. So. Let's talk a little bit about Mark. Mark's first story, short story, excuse me, appeared in print in 1992, the same year he started working in the book industry. He has published more than 25 books under the name Mark Leslie that include thrillers and fiction. Uh, Some of the books are Evasion, A Canadian Werewolf in New York, which I got to get, by the way, One Hand Screaming, Paranormal Nonfiction, like Haunted Hospitals, Spooky Sudbury, Tomes of Terrorland, and anthologies on Campus Chills, <laughs> Tesseract 16, and Obsession. So that's just a that is just a little bit. I actually ordered a couple books, uh, and I'm looking forward to reading them because I'm excited Ooh. about this. Now, Mark has generously, and I and I say this generously because I'm a screenwriter and I'm actually an option screenwriter. So, kind of, we're in the same boat, uh, kind of. We're both writers, so we understand that it takes time to get into publishing, right? And it takes time, yeah. you know, and if you could get someone to help you. So, he also writes books to help authors to navigate publishing. Uh, they include the seven keys of publishing success, an author's guide to working with libraries and bookstores. His industry experience includes, you were the former president of the Canadian Booksellers Association. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Several years in that role. It was a lot of fun. I love that. Board member of BookNet Canada. Are you still in that position? No, not at all. Uh, They're kind of like Nielsen BookScan, but uh, but just about books in Canada. Uh, A fantastic organization. They share lots of great data. Awesome. Uh, and there's so much more. You were the director of author relations and self-publishing for Rukatan Kobo. Is that how you pronounce yeah, that? Kobo, yeah. Kobo is uh, Canada's answer to Kindle. Nice. <laughs> uh, and, oh boy, director of, you do so much. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> director of business development for Draft 2 Digital and professional advisor for Sheridan College's Creative Writing and Publishing Honors Program. Not only does he do that, oh man, how do you how do you sleep? Do you sleep? Uh, Four hours is maybe a good night of sleep for me. 
<laughs> he has a podcast, Stark Reflections, writing and publishing, uh, about rubbing and publishing. He started in January 2018. By the way, I will put all Mark's links uh, to his books and all his things he does um, that you can look at my spooky friends and please check them out. Like I said, I think Mark is a fabulous author. I've just kind of read a little bit of his stuff and he's got me hooked already. So, awesome. again, <laughs> one of the things he just wrote, and, and, and this is your latest book, and uh, kids, take off your headphones, little kids, moms, take the little kids' headphones off. Yippee ki yay, motherfucker, about the movie Die Hard ah, is out now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, Tell me a little bit about this book. This is one of my favorite movies of all time. Yeah, it's one of the best Christmas classics of all time. So uh, it actually started, uh, it started with a book called The Canadian Mounted uh, last year that looks like an adult novel, um, but it's <laughs> actually from uh, an 80s uh, movie with uh, John Hughes wrote with John, uh, John Candy and Steve Martin. And there's a scene oh, right, at right, the right. LaGuardia Airport where John Candy's reading the book and he looks at Steve Martin for the first time. And he says, I know you, don't I? Uh, now, the script called for John to be reading, uh, Del Griffith, to be reading a pornographic novel. Well, there was a novel called The Canadian Mounted, published by Beeline Editions back in the 80s. I did not know that. I just thought, oh, what a, what a neat prop book, because I saw the same prop book in Deadpool 2. Yeah. And then sure. I went, was this a prop book? And I started doing research. I said, well, I'm going to write a book, and I'm going to make it a trivia book, and it'll be all about planes, trains, and automobiles, and it'll talk about the prop book. And then I found out it was a real book. So this this book, made to look just like the original, uh, mm -hmm. is a trivia book for planes, trains, and automobiles. And it came out last year in 2022 on the 35th anniversary of the movie. And mm -hmm. and fans like me of, of planes, trains, and automobiles, you know, Thanksgiving weekend coming up in the U.S., um, yes. fans like me just watch it every year, love it, whatever. Uh, so that was so mm -hmm. cool. And then I thought, this was fun. Why don't I take another movie I've watched hundreds of times? Every Christmas, mm -hmm. I watch Die Hard. It's not mm -hmm. Christmas Eve until Han Hans Gruber falls off Nakatomi Tower. And then yeah. I thought, well, what the heck? Why, why not do one for them? And I did this on the 35th anniversary, which was this July. It was when Die Hard was right. released 35 years ago. And of course, Yippie Kaye, you know, the, the catchphrase. And yeah, then, of course, yeah. I could not resist. I could not resist <laughs> doing some John McClane. So that's the I CN Tower. So the Canadian CN Tower with explosions. Um, my, I, I even bought a Ruger BB gun that looks like his. And, and of course, I took one of those shirts. He actually has a skull tattoo, and I really do have a skull tattoo on my arm. So, um, yeah, and then I, like, my partner came home from work, and she goes, why do you have blood on your face? I said, oh, I was doing a photo shoot. What? Oh, for my book cover. <laughs> so, anyways, it is just chock full of trivia about the movie, about the making of the movie, about the books that were, you know, adapted into screenplays to, for the first uh, first right. two films. And then the third film was based on a – no, the fourth film was based on a, an article in Wired magazine. So, again, I'm a big nerd. I love the behind the scenes. I love how – you know, uh, the, the the last uh, shot with Alan Rick Rickman where they tricked him when they dropped him because he actually is. They said on the count yeah. of three, we're going to drop you. But he told the guy to drop him on two. So he goes one, two. And Rickman was waiting for three, but then he dropped him soon. And that's why the look on his face is so perfect. But it was the last scene they shot in case something happened to him. <laughs> that... so, uh, wow. I mean, again, not horror, not spooky stuff. But, but you know, you, you said you're a big diehard fan. So yes, I, I have found myself... And because I research for ghost story books, I'm used yeah, to yeah. digging into research and pulling research out of macabre sure. things. And I thought, well, yeah. why not for some of the movies that I've watched hundreds of times? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'm guessing we're going to agree on this. Die Hard. Christmas movie or not a Christmas movie? Oh, of course it's a Christmas movie. I mean, come on. <laughs> I actually got into an argument over lunch. Uh, boy, probably a couple weeks ago, we were talking through Christmas movies, yeah. and everybody's like, "No, it, how is it a Christmas movie? There's no, like, the guy was arguing with me, and and then a, a, another coworker come in. She said, "No, no, no, it's not." And then another guy comes in. He goes, "Oh, yes, it is." And it turned, not, it didn't get heated, so it wasn't like we were yeah. beating each other up in the cafeteria. But everybody was like, "No," and then more and more people got involved, and it turned into this really like deep argument 
Christmas movie or not. And they said, their argument is the, the people who don't believe in it, like whatever, yeah. say, yes, okay, it's Christmas, I get it. it but I said, there was a, the central message of the movie is this. John McClane has lost his wife, who he loves dearly. He screwed up, like everyone yep. does in a relationship, and he wants her back. That's the central theme of the movie. Yep. The terrorist stuff, that's just icing on the cake, right? That yep. just yep. happens. Yeah, exactly. you, you take that, yeah, you take that stuff off, right? You take that stuff off, then you're just dealing with people, you know, just trying to get it together, right? And it's Christmas. And that, to me, my argument is, that's all Christmas, right? You oh, get together sure. with your, yeah, you get together with your family. Uncle Jack is drunk again. Aunt Millie is arguing yeah. about <laughs> some crazy, right? But you're like together yeah. and you love your family. And even though they're crazy or whatever, you're like, they're mine. And that's what makes Christmas. That's, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and this, yeah. this is a family stuck together at the Christmas party. So, I mean, you look at the checklist. So Stephen D'Souza, because uh, I threw a checklist in, I actually have a, a chapter called it's not Christmas until Hans Gruber falls off Nakatomi Plaza. And then I reference a joke Bruce Willis made at his roast. And the subtitle is, it is to a motherfucking Christmas movie. Because uh, he did say, he said, it's not a it's not a, a Christmas movie. It's a goddamn Bruce Willis movie. Uh, which mm-hmm. was kind of a funny thing that he said. But people took that to mean that he said it's not a Christmas movie. He was mm-hmm. just saying, no, 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 it's Bruce Willis. Because it was. It was his first major blockbuster. But take a look at this and you go, so... Uh, it takes place during the Christmas holiday. Die Hard entirely. White Christmas, the first and final scenes only. Right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, setting uh, at a Christmas party. Die Hard entirely. White Christmas, first scene only. <laughs> Number of Christmas songs. Die Hard has four of them in it. And White yep. Christmas only has two. <laughs> so it goes oh. to this. So if you take White Christmas, which everyone agrees is a Christmas film, oh, a Christmas and you compare movie, right? it, Die Hard is way yeah. more of a Christmas film. Uh, but yeah. anyways, yeah, I mean, so you can win debates. You can win debates on this. I'm going to get that book and we're going at it. I'm going to get those people. <laughs> so, <laughs> excuse me. So, before we move on, did I forget anything, Mark? Well, can I'm you old, so I've done a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, be yeah I, I put on a <laughs> Spider-Man costume and fail miserably because I have no spider powers. You know, stuff like that, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. I just want to make sure you don't leave tall buildings in a single bound and like can run around no. the world in a second. And yeah. none of those things, none of those things. I do make I do make a dozen mistakes before breakfast every day, though. So oh, so that's a superpower. There we yeah, go. Yeah, that is. That is. Yeah. <laughs> so again, my spooky friends, I will include all Mark's stuff on all my uh, media sites. Share everything, please. Check out Mark. He is awesome. So let's get to what everybody wants to know. We're going to ask to do a little bit of interview before we get to the spooky stuff. And one of the questions I always ask that, like to ask writers, because we do have writers who do listen to my podcast. Did you always have the desire to be an author, Mark? Or what did you, what did you think of when you were a little kid? You know? Yeah, I was, I was always fascinated with storytelling right from the earliest age. I, I used to play with little Fisher Price characters and I used to tell myself little stories. And then when I got older, I got the more advanced because there's the finger puppets. Then you got the ones with the movable arms and legs. And I used to tell myself serialized stories like the comic books I read, Spider-Man comic books, stuff like that, that were, you know, serialized month after month. So I would tell myself continuing stories. So it wasn't just playing. I was I was I was sharing stories. And then when I got a little bit older, I realized you could put stuff on paper. You could put these stories from your imagination on paper. Right. And then someone else could pick it up later. So from the earliest days, I just love that. Uh, in school, whenever you had assignments where they, they would write a sentence or two and they wanted you to finish the paragraph, uh, yeah. you know, I would write pages and pages or they'd want, want you to write one page and I would write like mm-hmm. a 30 chapter, uh, you know, story. Right, right, um, right. I, I was just always fascinated. I mean, I, I started uh, typing up stories because I'm, I'm of that age that the Internet didn't exist yet. Mm-hmm. Typing up stories on a manual typewriter. It, we didn't even have a photocopier in the town where I lived, a small town in oh, mid-northern wow. Ontario. Okay. So I couldn't even make copies to send. I had to send the originals away. And then, you know, I had the handwritten story. So if I wanted to send another mm-hmm. submission, mm-hmm. I had to retype it. And yeah. so yeah. what? I got my first rejection at the age of 15. Uh, it was a horror mm-hmm. story that I wrote. Uh, I sent it to CBC, which is kind of like NPR. 
in the U.S. Uh, it's a very okay. literary kind of mm. thing. And I sent them a horror story, <laughs> a 15-year-old. So obviously what? I got my first rejection from them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah. you know, I've, I've accumulated, uh, you know, a thousand rejections over the years from various publishers mm -hmm. and magazines. But yeah. I eventually started to get those stories published in small press magazines. Um, you know, my mm -hmm. very first mm -hmm. short story was a YA humorous story. But my very first um, horror story that got published called Phantom Itch was uh mm -hmm. phantom mitch i should say <laughs> mm -hmm. which is about a phantom mitch and a dead wife named uh, michelle mitch uh mm -hmm. and that was published in wicked mystic magazine and it did yeah. receive honorable mention in uh the mm -hmm. years about fantasy and horror so that was that was a really cool that was a really yeah. cool thing yeah yeah so that it, it's funny because like like i said i'm a screenwriter so i've done everything i can and i and uh once I became optioned, it was like, you know, it was like seeing the face of God or something. It was like, mm -hmm. ah, you know what I mean? That feeling. Oh, yeah. So let me go to this quick, quick uh, thing here. How did you go about publishing your first book? Because, again, like I said, I have authors here and I know there's a different ways without getting yeah. too deep into it because they can listen to your podcast and read yeah. your book. But just kind of just give my audience just a little bit of a taste of that. Well, the first book was 2004, and I self-published it. Um, and that was a lot of work because uh, there was no ebook uh, solutions available. I mean, right now, if you wanted to publish a book, you could use Draft to Digital to make a free ebook out of a Word document. Uh, and you can make the print-ready PDF uh, to go, and you can just use them to go everywhere. Or you can create a free free account with uh, Kindle Direct Publishing you know, Kobo Writing Life. Uh, I work at Kobo to create that platform for people. So, so right now, I mean, there's a the, the the money you should invest as a writer would be in an editor to help you make it better, and a, and yeah. a good cover designer to 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 make a beautiful cover, right? Yeah. Um, those are the yeah. two things you should invest in. Everything else is free, like making an EPUB, making a book ready for print. That the, the tools mm -hmm. the, are are free, but that that's what I would advise if someone's looking at getting their work out there and not having to wait for the gatekeepers in New York to say yes or no, mm -hmm. or like, as you know, the gatekeepers yeah. in Hollywood. <laughs> right. Yeah, that, that, that too. So what interested you in writing paranormal stories? I know you do that not yeah. all the time, but obviously you've written a number of them. What interested you in that? I think because I've always been fascinated by what if I've always mm -hmm. wondered what was hiding in the shadows, you know, and when I looked into the shadows, I didn't just see darkness. I saw, a hand creeping out or these glowing eyes in the dark, yeah, you know, so I was always right, imagining right. something more frightening than what was actually there. And yeah. uh, who knows, maybe, maybe some of the stories were therapy, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of everything. I'm afraid of the dark. And so it's kind of like, Hey, great. I'm just going to write about my fears. Yeah. And it, it was kind of funny because when I was younger, I remember writing a short story about a middle-aged guy who writes um, true ghost story and paranormal and monster books and Bigfoot and stuff like that. Because sure. I read tons of them when I was a kid. I loved them. Yeah. I just, anytime a new Bigfoot book would come to the library, the local librarian would go, Mark, we got a new UFO book or a new Bigfoot. <laughs> so I was just fascinated with ghosts and stuff because right. I couldn't get enough of it. And little did I know... <laughs> When I was in my middle age, I would have six books on the paranormal out there. I, I, I didn't even know wow. that was a thing. I thought it was just going to be fiction my whole life. So yeah. so that took me by surprise. A little yeah, that's awesome. Prophetic thing. And now when you um, write these stories, what inspires you not only to keep writing these stories, but what inspires your idea? Because there's so much you could write about, right? Yeah. Like what, 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 when you're thinking about that idea, when you're sitting wherever – uh, favorite coffee shop, you know, in your yeah. uh, living room. What what inspires you? Everything, honestly. Mm. It could be it could be something I hear on the radio. It could be uh, an article I'm reading about. It could be a book that I've just read. It could be a conversation over here at the cafe. It could be witnessing a car go by and almost hit someone and go, "Well, what would happen if they?" Yeah. So whatever. Mm. So the, the the my biggest challenge as a writer is I probably throw away. 20 to 30 good ideas a day only because yeah, yeah. they just keep right. coming at me. And then, and then you, you sit, I don't know. I, I, I sit down, I, I tend to write in the early morning hours and, and I blame mm -hmm. this on my dad. It was a early uh, fisherman. He was always up to wake up the rooster that woke up, woke up the sun. And he was always up really, really early because he loved that time of day. And I think I got that from him where I get up early while everyone's sleeping. It's nice and quiet mm -hmm. and dark and the sun hasn't come up yet. Mm -hmm. 
and get a couple hours of writing done before the rest of my yeah. day takes over. And I just go with an idea. So, for example, I'm writing a horror story right now for a, for a market mm. looking for Canadian horror fiction. And a line came to me. A mm. line came to me that was ironically inspired by one of my favorite books, the first line in a book, uh, John Irving's A Prayer for Owen Meany. Uh, mm. And it opens up like I'm doomed to remember a small boy with a wrecked voice. And it goes on, right? There's a really beautiful mm. long line. And so I yeah. thought I would riff on it because... Yeah, I opened it up with him because he's the reason I believe in ghosts, right? And that's how it, that's how that yeah. paragraph ends. Yeah. And and so many of my other stories, uh, there's a great Mark Twain piece called, um, uh, it's called a, a Curious Dream, and it's about a guy okay. at Halloween who sees a skeleton dragging a coffin down the street, and the skeleton stops, and and it's really just a sort of yeah. a satirical look at how they, they should really take better care of grave graveyards. Yeah, right, right. And, and so I took that story, which is in the public domain, and I thought, well, what if I took it to the next <laughs> level? What if I called it a curious nightmare? What if instead of just complaining, the skeletons actually got retribution? And so Ooh. so, so sometimes I'll read a classic story and go, that was cute that Mark Twain did that, but I'm going to take it five steps further. I was like, mm. What if the skeletons aren't just going to complain and yeah. leave the graveyard? What if they're going to take over? And so, mm. so ideas can come from almost anywhere. It's yeah. just sitting down and, and, and embracing them and, and kind of letting that muse flow through your fingers and onto the keyboard. Yeah, and that to me is really interesting because uh, one of the things I love writing about is writing about things, how you do one thing in your life and it screws up everything. So you could be the yeah. nicest, sweetest guy in the world and then you, I don't know, you you hit a dog. And people then label you as this terror. And it's just one dog thing. killer. Yeah. <clears throat> You're not your dog killer. And you, you could, you, who knows what's going on, you know, in your life. And you, and then this happens and your life is ruined. And you're, yeah. you know, and that's what I love writing about. I love taking characters and I look at characters kind of like yourself, just with the skeleton going, okay, how can I take this <laughs> to the next yeah. level, right? And see where we yeah. go. So, my other question too about writing is, before we get to the spooky stuff is what would you say when you're writing and this is always hard i think for paranormal writers is are you more a skeptic or a believer you know what i'm saying I, yeah, where, that's a where do you question. think you look at yeah well i'm a believer because the minute you turn the lights off i believe that there's lots of monsters that could kind of come to get me right i'm, I'm scared of everything but uh, yeah when i write when i approach my writing particularly the paranormal stuff I'm a skeptical believer, so I, I want to believe, but I also am aware that there's just so many reasons. I, I'll, get, I'll give you a perfect example. I'll, I'll get into yeah. so tomes of terror, haunted bookstores and libraries. I worked in bookstores most of my adult life, right, from university mm -hmm. uh, for you know, decades, worked in different bookstores. And, yeah. and so talking to different uh, bookstore people about ghostly experiences, mm -hmm. when the story is... Well, how do you know there was a ghost here? It's like, well, the books fell off the shelves all by themselves. They just fell off the shelves. I'm like, well, yeah. gravity, okay? But here's yeah, the yeah. other thing. And and again, I'm not a scientist in any way, shape, or form because I was never right. really good at math or science. But <laughs> I do know where I live in the world, in Ontario, Canada, which is, you know, north of New York, uh, where I where I live. In the summer, we have humid uh, summers. And the mm -hmm. mass market paperbacks will sit on the shelf. Right? So they sit on the shelf and they're spined and they're in their pockets and stuff like that. But then paper absorbs the humidity in the air and then they start to expand. <laughs> and when, when right. I stack a bunch yep. of scans, they flop over. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, yeah. so, I mean, I look at stuff like that and go, yeah, that's not enough. Now, there is a, there is there was one story where somebody walked through the kids section into the back room and and the there was nobody in the kids section. There was nobody in that area of the store. The books mm -hmm. were all neat. Everything's tidy. They come back less than a minute later, and all of the Goosebumps books from this one shelf are stacked up perfectly level right in the middle, as if somebody like took yeah. the care to really, really stack yeah. them. But that's kind of like, well, that wasn't gravity. <laughs> right? yeah. That wasn't humidity and gravity. That was, we don't know what that was. Yeah, that that is great. So tell me about some of your favorite haunted locations and and why did you decide to put these in write these stories and put them in your books well i i think when when i do locations uh, I've, I've typically written about places that i've lived uh, because there's a personal uh element to it so haunted 
Hamilton was the first book that I did for uh, Dundurn, which is Canada's largest independent publisher. And I was living in Hamilton, Ontario, and going on the ghost walks and enjoying it. And ironically, I mean, this this is this is market in, insights here. Um, I checked the market. There, there was a ghost walk group that you know it was enough to keep their business going, and there had never uh, been a book of ghost stories about the Hamilton area at all. Although there were some other books about the history of Hamilton and the War of eighteen twelve, which took place a lot, like you know, because we're so close to the U.S. And and then I overheard a uh, president from the publisher <laughs> say, "We've always wanted to publish a book of ghost stories about Hamilton." So I thought, yeah. "All right." The, the market is ripe for it. And so what I did with Hamilton is I went around to various places that I was familiar with and started to do research. I talked to people, talked to the ghost walks groups, and then um, did interviews. And so the stories that end up making it into the book end up being the ones that resonate enough and also have enough details. Because there may be a story that is only going to be a paragraph or two, and it may not be a full chapter. And that's always the biggest challenge is going, yeah, yeah that's cool, but there's not enough. And, and and you do have to, you do have to do some padding. And some of the padding, uh, the padding is the, the lane of the foundation of the backstory. Um, so one of my, one of my favorite stories from, yeah. from Haunted Hamilton is related to uh, some research that I do. Um, I also spend a lot of time going to the local uh, archivists at uh, the library, local library, the research librarians are really good. And when they find out you're working on a project and you want your, I'm, I'm researching hauntings and ghosts from the Hamilton area. And then their yeah. eyes light up and they go, oh, we've got folders and stuff and newspaper clippings and, and all kinds of stuff. And, uh, and I remember sitting there the, the one night, I wasn't allowed to take anything home, but the, you know, I had access to a photocopier that I could pay uh, for. So I was making tons of photocopies and coming home. And I was working a full-time job at the time. So I was working on this book, you know, from, you know, seven o'clock at night till whatever, and then going back in the in the morning to work. So I remember coming home with all this uh, research, uh, all these things piled up and working on this in the basement. My wife and my son were sleeping upstairs and I'm downstairs in the basement alone writing till three in the morning. And this was called uh, The Tombstone Ghost. That was the name of the chapter. And this was uh, a story that was uh, printed uh, in the Hamilton Spectator, which is the daily newspaper from Hamilton, Ontario. And there were there were uh, several articles. So one of the articles uh, basically relayed a story, and I'll give you the Reader's Digest version of it. But a okay. woman is laying in bed. Uh, she wakes up. She opens her eyes. And above her, floating just a couple feet above her bed, is this woman with gray, scraggly hair, just these mm. sunken eye sockets. You can't even see her eyes. And her mm. mouth is open as if she's screaming. So the woman just screams her head off, wakes up her husband, yeah. he freaks out. And then when she screams, the ghost kind of disappears off into the corner, like this corner of their mm. bedroom. And the husband never sees it, but it keeps happening night after night after night. She wakes up, oh, when she, wow. and it's usually when she's laying on her back. She sees this woman, uh, you know, who's like right, like looking at her as if wanting something. She screams. The woman takes off. They finally uh, bring in um, a priest. They bring in paranormal researchers from the U.S. that come in and they, they bring in a medium. And the medium basically gets in contact with this woman and finds out that it's the spirit of a woman who's lost something. Uh, her kids. She's lost her kids. She's looking for her kids. They must have died in some sort of tragic accident. Okay. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with her um, because the other thing is you never saw anything below her waist. Uh, you just saw mm. the, her upper torso as a ghost. Yeah. Eventually, they learned from a different medium uh, or from a different researcher that there was a woman who had lived on the grounds and had lost her kids and, and her husband at a young age, but she also lost her legs mm. in the the same tragic accident where oh, wow. they died. And so she was in a wheelchair for the rest of her life before she died. Oh. Weird story. Ten yeah. years later, ten yeah. years later, there's a picture of the guy, uh, him and his wife had now separated, uh, of course. Uh, they ended up moving on from, from this uh, apartment they were living in. Uh, but there was construction taking place, and they were tearing down the building where they had lived. And he's standing there with a, the art newspaper article from 10 years ago in yeah. one hand and a piece of a tombstone in the other. They found Ooh. the tombstone of the lady. They found her entire story, the tragedy. They realized that that was true, oh. that that had happened. She had lived there. A piece yeah. of the tombstone 
they must have the kids must have been buried and so sometimes it was in the wall and that's where the oh. ghost was there. the same wall like it was in that area where, where she was yeah. disappearing and so what i what i what i i just love this story because like 10 years later there was like they figured out what it was uh, and so as i'm writing this chapter there's a there's an artist rendition of the sketch of yeah. the of the howling ghost ha- hanging over her bed and every time I closed my eyes, I kept seeing it. And I am a big chicken. And I was so terrified. I remember sitting there in my office in the basement, two two stories up. Yeah. Uh, my wife and my son are sleeping. And it, the house is pitch black. It's three in the morning. I really need to get to bed, get two, three hours sleep before I can. I was afraid to turn off the lights and go right. walk through the dark right. and go upstairs. I thought, okay, I'll just sleep in my chair here in the office. And I sat there for 15 minutes thinking, oh, yeah, I could do this. And then I realized I finally talked myself into uh, into I think I had a flashlight or something that I was able to use to to navigate yeah. the dark. But it was just I just remember seeing that ghost every time I closed my eyes. And that uh, and that's the kind of story I love to write. So when it can get to me like that, yeah, hopefully the reader is uh, similarly, maybe probably not as scared as I am, but maybe they're somewhat mm-hmm. frightened just to hear those tales. Yeah. So. Uh, we're going to circle back to it's another scary story, but you actually, what I wanted to ask you was, you ever have a story affect you when you're doing the research on it? Yeah. You answered my question. Oh, sorry, I guess I, I jumped, out, I jumped Whoa, ahead no, on that one. No, no, that's great. <laughs> we're, we're, we're together. We're mind meld on that one. Um, and that to me, too, is when I'm doing research on certain things, that's happened to me, too. So I was doing research on this exorcism of this woman named Anna Eklund. And it happened in Iowa. And she had been having demonic thoughts for like over 20 years. This is in the early 1900s. Uh, yeah. And then in the mid 30s. And her exorcism took three weeks. Three weeks. Oh, my okay? God. So like we've seen that's that. Like, that's more painful than a long childbirth. Absolutely. And some of the, and this is nuns and priests and you're like, are they going to embellish some stuff? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. You know, that's for a debate for another time. Uh, but you know, they're talking about how she was, uh, getting sick, like buckets of vomit and everything else, like buckets yeah. and blood everywhere. And she was crawling on the walls and she was, scratching people and she had four different um people in her uh that was possessing her and, and like the you know it was just and i'm doing this and all of a sudden i have two cats and a dog and a white couple kids and a wife so i'm full up here okay yeah and so i'm sitting here and my house is really weird uh because it will creak and crack just like every house but I usually close the door just like you probably you did in your office or whatever. And I heard someone coming up to my door. Like you could hear on my, on my floor, like boop, boop, footsteps. And it's like three o'clock in the morning. And I'm like, well, my wife's not up. She's out. You know, yeah. she had a long week. And my kids definitely know not to bother dad and the dog and the cats. They leave me alone too. Yeah. And I was just like, should I open that door? Should I see who's behind it? And I literally was like, nope. Yep. <laughs> I literally just sat there and I just put my ear to the door and I was like, are they gone now? Are they... And I sat there and I'm like looking at my office and I'm like, well, I got a lazy boy. So <laughs> I can just sleep in that. You right? sleep here too. Well, it's it's same... amazing, right? That stories <laughs> affect you. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah. Well, and that stories we... affect you that way. Yeah, monkey's paw, right? You, you're like, don't open the door. You don't want to see what's yep. on the other side. <laughs> Mm, 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 no, thank you. So, well, how about uh, you did haunted hospitals? Yeah, I'm always intrigued with hospitals because they're unfortunately full of suffering and death. Yeah. And my my niece, uh, she was a nurse for about four years, and then she had to get out because she would literally go into a room and there would be like a dead person there. You know, yeah. they died during the night. It, it just messes with you, right? And my oh, yeah. and my niece was like. You know, Uncle John, I, I can't do this anymore because I was so proud of her being a nurse and helping people and, and yeah. doing the right thing. Right. And she was like, John, uh, Uncle John, I, I can't do this anymore. It's too, it's too hard. But it's, so why don't we t- talk about a story? Maybe you have a favorite hospital, a favorite story. Yeah. 
why don't we talk about that? Sure. I mean, it, it's interesting because I, I, related to your niece, there are people who are more sensitive and they and they, they yeah. can see things that the rest of us don't. And that, that that's going to be a hard place to work because when you think mm. about a hospital, you think this is the place. You think about the crossroads and, and places mm. where you know, spirits may be more, um, more, more visible, they may be more active. Mm. A place where people come in and out of the world. People are born in hospitals. People die in hospitals. And as you mentioned, trauma happens in hospitals, like high anxiety, yeah. high emotion, yeah. uh, happy emotion and, and sad and, and, and everything in between. So hospitals are, of course, a prime location for, for this. Mm -hmm. I was on a, a syndicated overnight radio program uh, that goes from like midnight till three in the morning, and yeah, coast, coast to coast. Um, and again, it's one of the ones where, you know, my uh, my my partner, she's sleeping in the other room. I'm I'm up doing my thing, my late night thing in the dark by myself. Yeah, I'm still yeah, scared. Yeah. Thank God she's there because at mm -hmm. least there's someone there to protect me. But mm -hmm. we're, we're sharing stories. But we got to a point in the program where there was live call ins from people. And I yeah. had mentioned uh, so I, I, I was talking about Tomes of Terror that I think had just come out the haunted bookstores and libraries. But I was saying, well, yeah. I'm working on haunted hospitals right now. And Rhonda yeah. Parrish and uh, my the co-author and I were working on this book. We got a call from a gentleman who wanted to share a story about uh, a hospital he worked at, the Pinocchio Institute in Alberta, uh, mm. Canada. Mm. And he had worked there for many years. It had been more than 10 years since he worked there. He retired now, but he wanted to share a story that he'd never shared before. And it was about a woman. So the, the chapter is called The Woman Possessed. And it was a woman mm. who had lived most of her life in that hospital. She had no family. And she would get into bouts of uh, violence where she, they'd take three sure. or four people to hold her down because she had this superhuman wow. strength that she could throw them yeah. off. She would scratch. She, she would bite. She'd be calm and, and fine and then just yeah. go right into this. Other things would happen mm -hmm. in, with her room where she'd be complaining that her room was like a, like a meat locker. It was so cold and freezing. They go in and oh, there was nothing yeah. wrong with the heater. Everything was fine. So they move her into another vacant room. And, yeah. you know, when the minute they move her into the other room, the mm. other room suddenly becomes a meat locker and the room she was in, it goes back to normal temperature. So weird stuff like that happened. They even had meetings. Mm. They did bring in priests. They thought they were wondering if she needed some sort of exorcism. But yeah. one of the nights where he was working by him, uh, there was shift. There's a bunch of them doing an overnight shift. And, and they've mm. got the break room with the TV and stuff like that where they're hanging out right. when they're not doing their rounds. So it was his turn to go do some rounds. And as he's walking down the hall, he walks by a room and he hears voices because sometimes you'd hear her talking mm. to someone else and you could actually hear another voice in the room. So he's yeah. like, oh, my God, is there another patient in there? So he opens the room. It's pitch black. She's sleeping. There's no one else in the room with her, but she's sleeping mm -hmm. while standing on the wall okay. about four Whoa. feet above the floor over top of her bed. She's completely horizontal. Her face is down. Uh, her hair is hanging yeah. down over her face. Her body's like her, she's moving like, like she's breathing, like in her sleep. Mm -hmm. There's no one else in the room. And that's yeah. what he sees. He doesn't know what to do. He's kind of like, I don't want to do. So he slowly backs up, closes the door, goes back to the TV room and never says anything because he doesn't know. Yeah. Did he see something? Whatever. Yeah. So he calls in and he tells the radio program this. <clears throat> so I'm working. I'm, I'm researching for haunted hospitals. What I do yeah, when yeah. someone tells me a story, I, I talk to the producer uh, ask George, you know, can I get the producer to find out who that yeah. was? Would they be willing to talk to me? Because I'd love yeah. to interview them for my... So, lo and behold, a couple weeks later, uh, I have a call with this person. Well, here's the interesting thing. One of his colleagues who worked there, mm. who work, also worked at the same hospital, oh. recognized his voice, knew who he was, yeah, and asked to meet him. Uh, Tim Hortons is like a Dunkin' Donuts. It's a, it's right, a, right. It's yep. a coffee shop chain here in Canada. They met at the local yep. Timmy's. Yeah. They met at the local Timmy's, eh? And uh, <laughs> and the the colleague told a story uh, about mm. one other night within that same year or two that happened to them. And they had walked by and heard her having a discussion with some other voice that was coming from the room that didn't sound like her. And they mm -hmm. walked in. They they saw her sleep standing. 
vertically wow. with her feet about a foot off the floor facing you know mm-hmm. she had her eyes closed and everything and she was just kind of sleep standing like yeah. like not looking at but looking straight and again that colleague didn't tell anyone because they didn't know what to do it was so unbelievable they backed out of the story and the only reason they yeah. confessed it was because they heard the story and they said, oh, my God, I saw something. Well, I didn't see the exact same thing, but I saw something very similar. And so that was like that stuck with me. And, I've, and I remember yeah. I remember telling the story uh, at a late night author event I was at in Colorado Springs years ago. And we're just sitting around telling ghost stories, as we sometimes do. And one yeah. of the one of the writers, there was also an artist and it did this beautiful sketch of this woman mm-hmm. standing on the side of the wall. I still have it. It was just like a sketch, for, like yeah. a ripped out sketch from a notepad. But I still have it because that's yeah. exactly how I saw it in my mind. And and so that's that's one of the ones that's just stuck with me over the years. Yeah, that. Oh, wow. That is amazing, too, because. One of the things I always, when I when I'm talking to and getting stories from people, is there's thousands out there people are not willing to talk about because it affected them at such a young age or a time in their life or their work, and they're just like, yeah, you know, what am I supposed to do? Speaking of that segue, (laughs) uh, was there a story that you wrote, you heard, you did research on that? affected you greatly like you were like for a week a couple of days whatever where you were just like man I, I, what's going on with that <laughs> yeah I, I go back to haunted hamilton so go back to haunted okay. hamilton and that was one where there was um they called it murder mansion so there's a story of this mm. uh building well my, my wife who grew up in in hamilton had um lived in the neighborhood and we ended up moving uh, the first the house we had was in that same neighborhood where she she grew up. And so we used to walk by this house and she said, yeah, when we were kids, we used to walk on the far side of the street because it was always vacant and scary. And yeah. we said there's yeah. some haunted and there was always stories about this haunted house. There always yeah. is in some yeah. neighborhood. Right. Well, yeah. lo and behold, I, I learned of Murder Mansion. In, in, in a nutshell, the story was the, the man who lived there had a. Yeah. Um, an axe. Uh, he went into the shed, grabbed an axe, and he murdered his wife and his kids. And then he went up to the widow's walk and he hung himself. And okay. the next family that moved into that house, uh, allegedly the the teenage son, found yeah. uh, a weapon, found uh, the axe, and and did murdered his family and and also hung himself. And nobody had ever lived in that house ever since. Now I did mm. some research and found that there was a little bit of. Uh, a little bit of uh, exaggeration in in the stories, <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. and they yeah. sounded a little bit too much like The Shining. Uh, and I do find that a lot of pop culture and movies sneak into some of the legends that we share. Yeah. So I wasn't able to confirm that any of those murders had happened, but this house had this aura about it that really scared people and continued to. Yeah. And yeah. the house, uh, when we were living in the neighborhood, so the house had been torn down before I started working on the. But this is beautiful prime real estate that overlooks the city. So it's the Niagara Escarpment, you know, the Niagara Falls, the, the, the Niagara Escarpment runs mm-hmm. into Hamilton. Mm-hmm. So Hamilton has like the mountain and then the city, the lower level. And it's looking down the escarpment. It's just beautiful to look out over the city. You can see Lake Ontario in the distance and stuff. Well, beyond the steel plants and stuff. <laughs> but, but you have this beautiful, like just this, this prime real estate. Nobody ever built, nobody ever uh, was trying to find out who owned it. Nobody ever built on that land. I remember going, um, I had like little headphones with a little uh, microphone because sometimes when I was doing research, I would just kind of dictate what I was seeing. And I'd, you know, walking around a building that's yeah. allegedly haunted and describing it. So when I get home, I can, I could write it down more effectively. Yeah. And yeah. you can hear the wind. I saw it, saw the recording on, on a cassette yeah. tape from back then. And I remember walking around in the middle of the afternoon it was the middle of the afternoon it was a little bit overcast you know but you know bright relatively bright uh despite it being overcast and i remember walking onto the grounds there even knowing that the stories were probably exaggerated just having those stories in mind and just mm-hmm. something about being in that location mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. uh scared right. scared the bejesus out of me but it also yeah. here's the thing kept going back i could not stop going back i was drawn to the ground and still to this day this is 20 years later 20 years later 
no one's built on that ground. It's still a, a vacant lot. And it's just and it's just now overgrown with bushes and stuff like that. And I keep thinking, man, you know, you could get a lot of money, <laughs> like whoever owns it. <laughs> like, it, it, are, are they afraid to build on it? Is it cursed land? Yeah. Why was I, why do I, when I go back, why do I want to always take a dip down that road and go, go look yeah. at that lot again? What is it about that that's drawing me to it? And where's yeah. that axe? Where's that axe? No. <laughs> <laughs> Red it's probably rub, Jack. I'm here for a drink, bartender. <laughs> <laughs> red rum. Oh boy. Um, so, so one of the things, like I said, you have had all these experiences, and you you mentioned that experience. Have you also had a, like a physical experience? Because you said that being drawn there, but have you, were you ever doing research, and all of a sudden, like I don't know, something pulls at you, and you're like, well, "What is this? I'm always alone. What's going on?" Something like that. No, no, but I did have, uh, not when I was researched, but when I was on my way to a, a haunted location, I did have a weird experience in, in a hotel room. Um, I should share that with you. Yes, please. It was, so uh, my partner, Liz, and I were uh, going down to a writer's conference in Orlando, Florida. So we're dr driving from right. Ontario to Orlando. We Ooh. decided to take four or five days to go down okay. um, because... Yeah. We wanted to stop at haunted bars and breweries. We, we love craft beer, and, and I was wanting to research. <laughs> so it was kind of like, let's go to places that are bars or breweries that because they have good beer, but they're also haunted stories. And you love talking to the people who work there and so taking notes. So we took a long time to go down. Now, my, my book, Haunted uh, Hospitals, had just come up. And I co-wrote that with Rhonda Parrish, so I only wrote half of the book. So Rhonda did half the research. I did the other half. But coming back, Liz and I decided to do it in two days, which is, you know, like, 15 hour drives, right? Yes. So on our way back, we went all the way from Orlando to Weston, West Virginia, to the Trans Allegheny uh, Lunatic Asylum, because Ooh. that was one of the chapters mm -hmm. Rhonda had written. Yeah. So I didn't really know all the details about it. And I thought, this would be so cool. We'll go. I'll have a copy of the book. I take a picture of me in front of the building. Yeah, we'll do it for promotional purposes, give it to our yeah. publicist, stuff like that, you know, that kind right. of fun stuff. And we can go on a tour of the, uh, there was the, the tour of the, the wing for the criminally insane. And so we, we're going to go on the tour. So we get into West Virginia at about one in the morning, driving through the mountains. It's all foggy. Mm -hmm. Finally get, I was like, oh, there's a, a Connor Lodge just up, just up ahead. Well, I, I run out of the car. Well, she stops the car first. I get out of the car. I go in. The parking lot is packed. I get in there and uh, I said, uh, do you have any rooms? And like, no, uh, completely booked up. You know, sorry, there's another hotel a couple miles down the road. So get back in, go down, get yeah. to the second hotel. Oh, my God, the parking lot's full. Are we ever going to find a place to sleep here tonight? Mm -hmm. Right. Get in there. Do you have any rooms? Yes, we have one room. But, and I'm waiting for the but. It's like, oh, it's just two, it's two, uh, it's two double beds. We don't even have a queen or a king or anything. Yeah, like, I don't right, care. Yeah. We're just going to sleep. That's fine. A place to, I, I take a broom closet at this point. So again, I, I I go get the bags. We check in. We get into the room. Liz takes the bed near the the washroom. I take the bed near the door, and uh, she falls asleep right away. That's that's her style. She puts a hoodie on. She flips it over her head, rolls over. She's out. She's out like a light. Hmm. I'm scared of the dark and stuff like that. So I'm laying there. It mm -hmm. takes me a while. I yeah. finally get to sleep, and then yeah. I wake up and I see, I hear something, shuffling, yeah. and I see Liz. Walking around the side of her bed towards the washroom, uh -huh. and I'm and I'm yeah. laying there, and I'm waiting for her to turn on the washroom light. Yeah, right. I'm waiting for her to turn on the washroom light, and while I'm waiting there for her to turn on the washroom light, wondering why she hasn't, I hear mm -hmm. breathing in the bed beside me, and I look over, mm -hmm. and Liz is still in bed. And I said, "Oh my God, there's a woman in the room!" And I sit up, and I'm terrified. You know, yeah. I take my 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 phone and I'm like looking around with the light and stuff like that, and I was like, "Okay, mm -hmm. oh my God!" And I look, and the the chain's still on the door. I was like, okay, here's what happened. I tell myself, you fell, as you fell asleep. You woke yeah. up, Liz went to the washroom. You saw her go to the washroom. You fell asleep. Mm -hmm. You slept for five minutes. You opened your eyes and thought only two seconds had passed. She was already back in bed. That happens all the time, right? Weird right. time. No problem. Later, I wake up. I finally get back to sleep. I wake up and I hear this sort of something on, on the desk at the end of my bed where my laptop and our passports are, right? Because we're in the States right. and we're Canadians. 
And I'm like, oh my God, there's somebody in the room. I'm convinced there's somebody in the room yes. going yeah. through our stuff. I sit up and there's no one there. And I look and the chain's on the door and I check the, you know, the door between the two rooms and it's still mm -hmm. closed. And I also had a, you know, the bag, um, you put the little carousel and then you put your bag on top of it when yeah. you're unpacking. So that's yeah. there and it hasn't been pushed aside. So I was like, okay, Mark, you're overly paranoid because you're going to check out a haunted place in the morning. And, and I, 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 I've made the mistake of waking her up and telling her, I think there's a yeah. monster. And then. <laughs> she gets mad at me because I have to, she goes and checks for the monsters so I can go to bed. So I'm not waking her up. Yeah. There's no way I'm waking her up. I finally get to bed. We're getting ready in the morning. And this is the thing that's fascinating to me. I've already convinced myself that I've tricked myself and I've seen things and heard things. I get up and I say, so, um, do you, it, uh, do you get up in the middle of the night? She goes, no. I said, really? You didn't go to the washroom? She goes, no, mm -hmm. I, I didn't get, get up at all. I was just stayed in bed the whole night. And I was like, are you sure? Yeah. And she goes, why? And I said, well, he, he, funny story. So I tell her what I witnessed the night before. And then she's a non-believer, right? She's the skeptic. She's very, very skeptical. Her yeah. face goes completely white as I'm telling the story. And I go, what? And she said, well, I didn't get out of bed, but um, I'm sleeping with my hoodie. I'm rolled over in the middle of the night. And I could feel somebody standing over me. I, and I knew it wasn't you. And she said, and then. I felt a hand on my shoulder, and it wasn't your Wait. hand. It was uh -oh. a woman's hand. I felt a woman's hand on my shoulder, and she thought, yeah. oh, my God, there's a woman in the room. And, and Liz is very feisty. Unlike me, I would have just peed myself, but she's very feisty. So she steals herself up, and she's ready yeah, to just ready roll to... over and knock oh. her out, right? Like, give her a yeah, smack yeah. in the head. And there's no one there. And, and she was convinced there was a woman that was leaning over her, looking at her, and mm. touching her. I was convinced yeah. I saw a woman go around the side of her bed. I was convinced that s someone was moving some of our stuff around in the room at the end of her bed. Yeah. And honest to God, like that was the thing. We can't explain it. Mm -hmm. And I did research. I tried to find research about this hotel and I could not find any scrap of mm -hmm. research that anyone mm -hmm. else has had anything weird happen. But I thought there's got to be a woman in that room. There's got to be a woman. Um, right. So it was kind of a, that was kind of a spooky situation. Ooh. That is a spooky situation. So three quick things here. One, I thought you were going to say the famous scene from Planes, Trains, and Automobiles where John Candy and Steve Martin are staring at the bed and they're thinking, there's no way I'm going to sleep with this dude in this bed. Oh, you know what? Liz, Liz, Liz and I have been together for 10 years and she, no, she has not done that to me yet. Or she's like, I got out. We're not sharing this bed. <laughs> and, and, and then the, one of my favorite lines in any movie ever where they wake up in the morning and they're playing that soft, sweet music. And people, yeah. if you've not seen Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, please, I'm begging you, see it. It is so funny and so tender at the end with this great ending. I won't spoil the alert. But the John Candy kisses, or I think it's, is it John Candy kisses Steve Martin? Or is it Steve, Steve Martin? Steve kisses? Martin kisses John Candy's. John Candy. Oh, no, no, yeah. it's the other way around. John Candy kisses no, John Steve Candy Martin. Kisses. And he says, yeah, and, you know, uh, why did Neil? Why did you kiss my ear? Why why did you kiss my ear? Yeah. And he said, and, then, and he well, says, "Why are you holding my hand?" But why am I holding my hand? Where's your other hand? Between two pillows. <laughs> pillows. Those are <laughs> pillows. <laughs> yeah, that is. Uh, when I when I sign the book, the Canadian Mounted, I usually ask people their favorite line, and if they they can't tell me what their favorite line, I usually just write, "Those aren't pillows," and I sign it because <laughs> that uh, is. I, that is one of the most oh. classic lines. Uh, classic. Did now, you you know that it took them about fifteen or sixteen times to do that? Because every time they went to shoot and they're doing like back in baby's arms and they're yeah. they're panning over the two of them yeah, in yeah, bed yeah. together, like curled up together, yeah. all cuddly. Mm -hmm. the, either either one of the actors started laughing or the cameraman would start laughing and would shake the camera so much. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it took yeah. Them so oh, long I to believe do that. it. I believe it. And, and then you know what the what's so great is like what two men do when they have had some kind of awkward moment with one another. Yeah. They talk macho. Yeah. Like, oh yeah, the bears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go oh, yeah. Gonna go all the way this year. Gonna go all the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so funny because um, a couple of years ago, me and my buddy we got caught in a kind of similar situation. And I said, dude, I'll just sleep in the chair. I don't care. He goes, no, I'll sleep in the chair. And he goes, well, we're not sleeping together, are we? And he's like, no. And we've known each other since we've been in eighth grade. Right. So like, it's no big deal. 
And uh, so I had to do the scene. So I go into his bed early in the morning. I kiss him on the ear. And he goes, don't you dare put your hand in that. And I, <laughs> we both love that movie. And yeah, we were just, we both got up and we were both, oh, I don't know. we're Packers fans. So we're like, oh, oh my God. Packers, they're going to go. I'm going to go. Yeah. Uh, so what's funny too is I just did three stories on some of the most famous asylums in the United States, uh, Randolph Asylum, Edinburgh Asylum, and also Wood County Asylum, which is now a scrapyard in Wisconsin. Oh. And one of the things all of them have in common, you're talking about how is the deep stories and there's unmarked graves, like for example, uh, Randolph and Edinburgh have roughly 100 to 200 unmarked graves somewhere. I mean, they're still there. Uh, Edinburgh, you can go and visit, uh, which I would highly recommend. It's in Marshfield, Iowa. Yeah. Um, Winchester, Indiana is where Randolph Asylum is. And there's this creepy, like, doll exhibit in there of these porcelain dolls that this one... Oh. Uh, I'd love you to do a story on that. No, no, last see, that's, that's, just, that's too scary. It, it's great. Right. And you look at my Give Instagram. Bloody I have a over dolls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And look at my Instagram, and I have a picture of the actual picture people have taken when they've been investigating that. Anyway, third one is Wood County Asylum. And uh, that is now a scrapyard. But, like, people have been there, you know. These are, you know, again, the tough guys work the scrapyard yeah. and all that stuff. Some are just scared like a uh, smart. They're, they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're like, Something moves, something happened. The security guards at night tell stories all the time of gates opening, doors opening, feelings they're being watched, being they're followed. But I just think that was really interesting. And then my last really quick thing is I just did a story on doppelgangers, which absolutely oh. fascinates me. So there's been, not recently, but I would say maybe in the past few years, uh, there have been people who, and one of my favorite stories is like this guy went to work one day and he just goes in his office and he's late and he goes in, oh, oh crap, my boss is going to kill me. I'm late. It's an important meeting. Comes in there and people are coming out of the meeting and he's like, oh shit, you know, here, here I'm going to get, and the people look at him and they're like, well, how did you get out here so fast? He's like, what, what do you mean? He goes, I'll be honest with you. I just got here. I'm sorry, I'm late. I overslept. And, then, and they just, they said, this lady looking at him just turned just pale white and goes, no, you're in the meeting. And, and he's like, no, uh, okay, look, I, I know you're covering for me. Forget it. I, I get it. And he goes, no, you were in the meeting. And so then he goes, okay, whatever. And he goes to his desk. And when he comes around his desk, he sees this man in this desk and he's like, Oh my God, did I get fired already? What the hell? And the guy turns around and it's him in oh, his desk, sitting in his desk chair. And the guy, they took one, they take a look at each other. The guy freaks out, you know, uh, and his doppelganger just kind of walks away and they never sees him again. Oh, wow. But that's kind of like, you hear that a lot, you know, where people, like I said, uh, not as much as ghosts, but you hear that a lot recently where people have said, you know, I, my wife says, wait a minute, wait, you, you already came to bed. I'm like, no. Like, I had a story where yeah. a guy, uh, just really quickly, he um, was getting ready for bed, and he sees his wife go into the room, and he goes, okay, no, no big deal. And then his daughter comes out and says, hey, uh, Dad, can you wake Mom off the couch? And he's, he's no, honey, she, she went. She's in the bedroom. I just saw her. He goes, no, Dad, come here. And there's his wife the mom on the couch sleeping oh. and as they both woke up the mom told her and they all freaked out they all slept in the living room that night and no one went in the bedroom <laughs> i'm just like absolutely i wouldn't go in that bedroom oh yeah for but, sure but that's kind of similar to this story you know in the sense of was there someone trying to warn her was there a woman trying to warn her was there what you know i yeah. just think that's fascinating right yeah it's just absolutely fascinating. So one question I have is, do you think we will ever have, before we wrap up here, have the 
definitive proof that ghosts exist? Do you think that would ever happen? It's difficult because, um, as, as Hamlet tells his best friend, there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our philosophies. Um, mm-hmm. and, 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 and that's because even when you think about science, there were so many things about science we did not understand, we did not know, we did not perceive. We're only able to perceive them because of some advances that allow us to see something that we couldn't see before. Right. We couldn't see infrared before until we had certain filters and stuff like that, right? So there are probably things that exist. And and I have to believe that it's not all in our imaginations because across cultures and time and eras and people, and it doesn't matter where in the world they're from, there is some sort of spirit, some sort of belief in life after death or some sort of yeah. belief that there's more to just this mortal existence. Mm-hmm. So yeah. we probably don't have the means to measure yeah. uh, or, or see those things. And that's, will we ever in our, in our lifetimes, who knows when you think, yeah, when you yeah. think about the, the, the history of, of the world and the millions of years it's existed and just yeah. the, the, the microcosm of, of humanity <laughs> as we know yeah. it, when you think, right. you know, yeah, a few right. thousand years, right? That kind of thing. So there's so much more. Uh, mm-hmm. Will we actually have a, a some sort of scientific provable measurement? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But that is not going to stop us from wanting yeah. to believe. That is not going to stop us from talking about it. That yeah. is not going to stop people's fascination. Because yeah. as you know, uh, it is it is a hot topic button. Whether you're a believer or a skeptic, it's still yeah. a hot topic for people to talk about, just like whether or not Die Hard is a Christmas movie. Or not. <laughs> so wrapping up here, thank you so much, Mark. I could talk to you for hours. You're awesome. Please, my spooky friends, check out Mark's his books, his sites, his podcast. Uh, he's amazing. And again, like I said, man, I, I wish I could have you on for hours. Maybe we'll have you on again sometime. I'd but love if you to. Thanks, meet, John. It's a yeah, lot of fun. Yeah. So yippee ki yay, motherfucker. Go get it. Uh, again, I'm getting it so I can argue with my non-believers and skeptics <laughs> of Die Hard Christmas movies. But uh, before we, uh, we always, before we wind up the show, we always say, say hi to your ghost. Hello, ghost. Hello, you ghost. never know. You might have a ghost in your house. And hi, stay... doppelganger. <laughs> <laughs> and stay spooky. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, John. Have a great day.